The Kennedy family has suffered numerous tragedies. They include Rosemary Kennedy's failed lobotomy, the assassinations of brothers John F. Kennedy and Robert F. Kennedy, the controversial Chappaquiddick incident, and four aeroplane crashes. Joseph P. Kennedy Jr., Kathleen Kennedy Cavendish, Edward M. Kennedy, and John F. Kennedy Jr., with all but Edward Kennedy's being fatal. Joseph Patrick Kennedy was born in Boston, Massachusetts. He was the eldest son of Mary Augusta Hickey Kennedy and P.J. Kennedy, a successful businessman, ward boss, and Irish-American community leader. On October 7, 1914, Kennedy married Rose Elizabeth Fitzgerald, the eldest daughter of John Francis Honey Fitz Fitzgerald, a Democratic mayor of Boston and probably the most recognized politician in the city. The marriage joined two of the city's most prominent Irish-American political families. The couple had nine children. As Kennedy's business success expanded, he and his family kept homes in the Boston area, suburban New York City, Hyannis Port, Massachusetts, and Palm Beach, Florida. Kennedy made a large fortune as a stock market and commodity investor, and by investing in real estate and a wide range of industries. He never built a significant business from scratch, but his timing as both buyer and seller was usually excellent. Sometimes he made use of inside information in ways which were legal at the time, but were later outlawed. He later became the first chairman of the SEC. After his death, various gangsters, including Frank Costello, claimed to have associated with Kennedy. In 1938, Theodore Roosevelt appointed Kennedy as the United States ambassador to the court of St. James in London. Kennedy hugely enjoyed his leadership position in London high society, which stood in stark contrast to his relative outsider status in Boston. Kennedy rejected the warnings of the prominent member of parliament, Winston Churchill, that any compromise with Nazi Germany was impossible. Instead, Kennedy supported Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's apparent policy of appeasement. In British government circles during the Blitz, Kennedy was widely disparaged as a defeatist. When the American public and Roosevelt administration officials read his quotes on democracy being finished and his belief that the Battle of Britain wasn't about fighting for democracy, all of it being just bunk, they realized that Kennedy could not be trusted to represent the United States. Joe Kennedy was a fiercely ambitious individual who thrived on competition and winning, and in his eyes, the ultimate price was the American presidency. Joe Kennedy wanted his first son, Joe Jr., to become president, but after his death in World War II, he became determined to make his eldest surviving son, John, president. Joe Kennedy was consigned to the political shadows after his remarks during World War II that democracy is finished, and he remained an intensely controversial figure among US citizens because of his suspect business credentials, his Roman Catholicism, his opposition to Roosevelt's foreign policy, and his support for Joseph McCarthy. As a result, his presence in John F. Kennedy's presidential campaign had to be downplayed. Having him in the spotlight would hurt John, making it look as if it were his father who was running for president. However, Joe Kennedy still drove the campaign behind the scenes. He played a central role in planning strategy, fundraising, and building coalitions and alliances. When John F. Kennedy was asked about the level of involvement and influence that his father had held in his razor-thin presidential victory, JFK would joke that on the eve before the election, his father had asked him the exact number of votes he would need to win. There was no way he was paying for a landslide. John's presidency was a victory for Joe. He saw it as a step forward, not just for his son, but for the entire Kennedy family. Joe was a family man and strategically constructed his family's image towards the public. He once said, image is reality, and the presidency framed the Kennedy family picture. Born July the 25th, 1915, 
Joseph Patrick Kennedy Jr., or Joe, was a junior officer in the United States Navy, a naval aviator and a land-based bomber pilot during World War II. Joe Jr. had been expected to become the family's political standard bearer, especially after his father's political exile for supporting the appeasement policy of Neville Chamberlain in the advent of World War II. Born May 29, 1917, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, also known as Jack, or often referred to by his initials JFK, was the 35th President of the United States. John represented Massachusetts' 11th Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1947 to 1953 as a Democrat. John defeated then-Vice President Richard Nixon in the 1960 U.S. presidential election. Born on September 13, 1918, Rose Marie Kennedy, also known as Rosemary, was a placid and easygoing child and teenager. However, the maturing Kennedy became increasingly assertive in her personality. She was reportedly subject to violent mood swings. Some observers have since attributed this behavior to her difficulties in keeping up with siblings who were expected to perform to high standards, as well as the hormonal surges associated with puberty. Born February 20th, 1920, Kathleen Agnes Kennedy, also known as Kik, was the fourth child and second daughter of Rose and Joe Kennedy. Kathleen worked at Sissy Patterson's newspaper, The Washington Times Herald, in 1940, writing a column titled, Did You Happen to See? In 1943, she returned to England to work in a center for servicemen set up by the Red Cross. Despite the opposition of her Catholic mother, she married William Cavendish, Marquess of Hartington. Born July 10, 1921, Eunice Kennedy Shriver was the founder in 1962 of Camp Shriver and in 1968 the Special Olympics. Her husband, Robert Sargent Shriver Jr., was United States Ambassador to France and the Democratic Vice Presidential Candidate in the 1972 US presidential election. Shriver was a key founder of the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Born May 6, 1924, Patricia Helen Kennedy was considered the most sophisticated, yet also the most introverted, of her parents' five daughters. She met British actor Peter Lawford through her sister Eunice in the 1940s. They courted briefly and officially announced their engagement in February 1954. They married on April 24, 1954, two weeks before her 30th birthday. Born November 20th, 1925, Robert Francis Kennedy, also referred to as Bobby or by his initials RFK, was an American politician and a noted civil rights activist, an icon of modern American liberalism. He was a U.S. Attorney General from 1961 to 1964. Following his brother John's assassination, Robert continued to serve as Attorney General under President Lyndon B. Johnson for nine months. Born February the 20th, 1928, Jean Ann Kennedy is an American diplomat and a former United States ambassador to Ireland. She has been described as the shyest and most guarded of the Kennedy children. Jean is the founder of Very Special Arts, an internationally recognized non-profit organization dedicated to creating a society where those with disabilities can engage with the arts. Born February the 22nd, 1932, Edward Moore Kennedy, also known as Ted or Teddy, was a United States Senator from Massachusetts. Serving almost 47 years, he was the second most senior member of the Senate when he died and is the fourth longest serving Senator in United States history. For many years, he was the most prominent living member of the Kennedy family, and he was the last surviving son of Joe and Rose Kennedy. Their political involvement has revolved around the Democratic Party. Harvard University educations have been common among them, and they have contributed heavily to that university's John F. Kennedy School of Government. The wealth, glamour, and photogenic quality of the family members, as well as their extensive and continuing commitment to public service, has elevated them to iconic status over the past half century and has led to their reputation as America's royal family. In 1941, when Rosemary was 23, 
Doctors told her father that a new neurosurgical procedure, lobotomy, would help calm her mood swings and sometimes violent outbursts. After the procedure, Rosemary was left permanently incapacitated and required constant care. Rosemary lived for several years at Craig House, a private psychiatric hospital an hour north of New York City. Rosemary died from natural causes on January the 7th, 2005, at the age of 86. She was the fifth of the Kennedy children to die, but the first to die from natural causes. Joseph Kennedy Jr. earned his wings as a naval aviator in May 1942 and was sent to Britain in September 1943. In mid-1944, he volunteered for an Operation Aphrodite mission. Operation Aphrodite made use of unmanned, explosive-laden aeroplanes that were deliberately crashed into their targets under radio control. These aircraft could not take off safely on their own, so a crew of two would take off and fly to 2,000 feet before parachuting from the aircraft. Sadly, 10 minutes before the planned crew bailout, the Torpex explosive detonated prematurely and destroyed the Liberator, vaporizing Joe Jr. and his co-pilot. Joseph Patrick Kennedy Jr. died on August 12, 1944, at the age of 29. Kathleen Kennedy's husband, William Cavendish, was killed in action on September the 10th, 1944, whilst serving in World War II. After the death of her husband, Kathleen eventually became romantically involved with Peter Wentworth Fitzwilliam, 8th Earl Fitzwilliam. The couple planned to wed after Lord Fitzwilliam's divorce. However, while on a trip to the south of France, both were killed as a result of an aeroplane crash. Kathleen Agnes Kennedy died on May 13, 1948, at the age of 28. John Fitzgerald Kennedy and Jacqueline Kennedy had four children. Kennedy suffered a miscarriage in 1955 and gave birth to a stillborn baby girl, Arabella, in 1956. Jacqueline Kennedy subsequently gave birth to a second daughter, Caroline, in 1957, a son, John, in 1960, both via cesarean section. On August 7, 1963, Jacqueline Kennedy gave birth to their fourth child, Patrick Bouvier Kennedy. He was born by emergency cesarean section five and a half weeks early. His birth weight of four pounds, ten and a half ounces, medically classified him as premature. Right after his birth, he was transferred to Boston Children's Hospital, where he died two days later of hyaline membrane disease. His obituary in the New York Times stated that, at the time, all that could be done for a victim of hyaline membrane disease is to monitor the infant's blood chemistry and to try to keep it near normal levels. A funeral mass was held on August the 10th, 1963, in the private chapel of Cardinal Richard Cushing in Boston. The child was initially buried at Hollywood Cemetery in Brookline, Massachusetts. His body and that of his stillborn sister, Arabella, were reinterred on December 5th, 1963, alongside their father at Arlington National Cemetery. On December 19, 1961, at the age of 73, 
Joseph Patrick Kennedy Sr. suffered a major stroke. He survived but lost all power of speech and was left paralyzed on his right side. Kennedy did regain certain functions with the help of therapies. Most notably, he went to the Institutes for the Achievement of Human Potential in 1964, a Philadelphia center that teaches therapies for people with brain injuries. Kennedy made gains with therapy and began walking with the help of a cane. His speech also showed some improvement. However, being 75 years old and greatly weakened, Kennedy was soon confined to a wheelchair. Despite being severely disabled from the stroke, Kennedy remained aware of the tragedies that befell his family during that time until his own death on November 18, 1969. In 1946, US Representative James Michael Curley vacated his seat in the strongly Democratic 11th Congressional District in Massachusetts at Joe's urging to become mayor of Boston. John F. Kennedy ran for the seat, beating his Republican opponent by a large margin. He then served as a congressman for six years. In the 1952 election, he defeated incumbent Republican Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. for the US Senate seat. The following year, he was married to Jacqueline. Jacqueline Bouvier married John F. Kennedy on September 12, 1953 at St. Mary's Church in Newport, Rhode Island, in a mass celebrated by Boston's Archbishop, Richard Cushing. On January 2, 1960, Kennedy initiated his campaign for president in the Democratic primary election, where he faced challenges from Senator Hubert Humphrey of Minnesota and Senator Wayne Morse of Oregon. Kennedy defeated Humphrey in Wisconsin and West Virginia, Morse in Maryland and Oregon, his victory in West Virginia confirmed his broad popular appeal. At the Democratic Convention, he gave his well-known New Frontier speech, saying, For the problems are not all solved, and the battles are not all won. And we stand today on the edge of a new frontier. On Thursday 21, the President and First Lady arrived in San Antonio to deliver a dedication speech for U.S. Air Force School of Aerospace Medicine at Brooks Air Force Base. Kennedy expressed modern, liberal, and sometimes idealistic views during his presidency, giving some of the most memorable and profound speeches. Mr. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, Governor, Mr. Vice President, Senator, members of the Congress, members of the military, ladies and gentlemen, more than three years, I've spoken about uh, the new frontier. This is not a partisan term, and it's not the exclusive property of Republicans or Democrats. It refers instead to this nation's place in history, to the fact that we do stand on the edge of a great new era, filled with both crisis and opportunity, an era to be characterized by achievement and by challenge. On Friday, November 22, 1963, Kennedy, his wife Jacqueline, and the rest of the presidential entourage arrived at Love Field in Dallas, Texas, aboard Air Force One, after a very short flight from nearby Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth. The motorcade cars had been lined up in a certain order earlier that morning. The original schedule was for the president to proceed in a long motorcade from Love Field through downtown Dallas and end at the Dallas Business and Trade Mart. The original scheduled route had the motorcade continue straight onto Maine instead of turning onto Houston. But it was discovered that Elm Street provided the only direct link from Dealey Plaza to the Stemmons Freeway. Thus, the route was altered. The presidential motorcade began its route without incident 
stopping twice so President Kennedy could shake hands with some Catholic nuns. Just before 12.30 p.m., President Kennedy was riding on Houston Street and slowly approached the Texas School Book Depository head on. According to witnesses, the shooting began shortly after the limousine made the turn from Houston onto Elm Street. Most of these witnesses recalled the first shot happened after the president had started waving with his right hand. The limo driver and police motorcycles turned on their sirens and raced at full speed to Parkland Hospital. Passing their intended destination of the Dallas Trademark along the way. President Kennedy was pronounced dead shortly after arrival at Parkland Memorial Hospital. Taking place during the Cold War, it was first unclear whether the shooting might be part of a larger attack upon the US. And whether Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson who had been riding two cars behind in the motorcade, was safe. Around the world, there was a stunned reaction. The body of President Kennedy was brought back to Washington, D.C. and placed in the East Room of the White House for 24 hours. Vice President Johnson took the oath as president on board that flight. This is a sad time for all people. We have suffered a loss that cannot be weighed. For me, it is a deep personal tragedy. I know that the world shares the sorrow that Mrs. Kennedy and her family bear. I will do my best. That is all I can do. I ask for your help and God's. The news shocked the nation. Men and women wept openly. People gathered in department stores to watch the television coverage, while others prayed. Traffic in some areas came to a halt as the news spread from car to car. Schools across the US dismissed their students early. Anger against Texas and Texans were reported from some individuals. Various Cleveland Brown fans, for example, carried signs at the next Sunday's home game against the Dallas Cowboys, decrying the city of Dallas as having killed the president. Lee Harvey Oswald, reported missing to the Dallas police by Roy Truly, his supervisor, was arrested approximately 70 minutes after the assassination for the murder of a Dallas police officer, J.D. Tippett. Tippett had spotted Oswald walking along the sidewalk in the residential neighborhood of Oak Cliff, three miles from Dealey Plaza. Officer Tippett had earlier received a radio message which gave a description of the suspect being sought in the assassination and called Oswald over to the patrol car. Tippett got out of his car and Oswald shot him four times. Oswald was next seen by shoe store manager Johnny Brewer who saw him slip into the nearby Texas theatre without paying. Brewer alerted the theatre's ticket clerk who telephoned police. Oswald was charged with the murders of Kennedy and Tippett later that night. He denied shooting anyone and claimed he was a patsy who was arrested because he had lived in the Soviet Union. Oswald's case never came to trial because two days later, 
while being escorted to a car for transfer from Dallas Police Headquarters to Dallas County Jail, he was shot and killed by Dallas nightclub owner Jack Ruby, live on American television. Arrested immediately after the shooting, Ruby later said that he had been distraught over the Kennedy assassination and that Oswald's death would spare Mrs. Kennedy the discomfiture of coming back to trial. The state funeral of John F. Kennedy took place in Washington, D.C. during the three days that followed his assassination. On the Sunday, his coffin was carried on a horse-drawn caisson to the U.S. Capitol to lie in state. Throughout the day and night, hundreds of thousands lined up to view the guarded casket. Representatives from over 90 countries attended the state funeral on Monday, November 25. The widow wearing a black veil and holding the hands of her two children, John Jr., who celebrated his third birthday on the day of his father's funeral, and Caroline led the way up the steps of the cathedral. The three-year-old John Jr. stoically saluted his father's casket during live television coverage of the funeral procession. After the Requiem Mass, the late president was laid to rest at Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia. Kennedy was the youngest man and the first Roman Catholic ever elected to the presidency of the United States. His administration lasted 1,037 days. On June 19, 1964, Kennedy was a passenger in a private Aero Commander 680 aeroplane. Flying in bad weather from Washington to Massachusetts, it crashed into an apple orchard in the western Massachusetts town of Southampton. On the final approach to the Barnes Municipal Airport in Westfield, Tragedy strikes again at the Kennedy family, but the blow to Senator Ted Kennedy is not fatal. The crash of his befogged plane in an apple orchard near Springfield, Massachusetts, did, however, kill his pilot and his aide. The senator's back is broken, and his guests, Senator and Mrs. Birch Bayh of Indiana, are less seriously injured. To the hospital where the 32-year-old brother of the late president is taken come members of his family, headed by Attorney General Robert Kennedy. Besides losing one brother in last November's assassination, he has also lost another brother and a sister, both in plane crashes. The pilot and Edward Moss, one of Kennedy's aides, were killed. Kennedy was pulled from the wreckage by fellow Senator Birch Bay and spent months in a hospital recovering from a severe back injury, a punctured lung, broken ribs and internal bleeding. He suffered chronic back pain for the rest of his life. In 1968, presidential primary elections in California were held on Tuesday, June 4. Four hours after the polls closed in California, Kennedy claimed victory in the state's Democratic presidential primary. At approximately 12.10 a.m., he addressed his campaign supporters in the Ambassador Hotel's Embassy Room Ballroom in the mid-Wilshire district of Los Angeles. At the time, the government provided secret service protection for incumbent presidents, but not for presidential candidates. Kennedy's only security was provided by former FBI agent William Barry and two unofficial bodyguards, former professional athletes. During the campaign, Kennedy had welcomed contact with the public and people had often tried to touch him in their excitement. Kennedy had planned to walk through the ballroom when he had finished speaking, 
on his way to another gathering of supporters elsewhere in the hotel. However, with deadlines fast approaching, reporters wanted a press conference. Campaign aide Fred Dutton decided that Kennedy would forgo the second gathering and instead go through the kitchen and pantry area behind the ballroom to the press area. Kennedy finished speaking and started to exit when William Barry stopped him and said, no, it's been changed, we're going this way. Barry and Dutton began clearing a way for Kennedy to go left through swinging doors to the kitchen corridor. But Kennedy, hemmed in by a crowd, followed maitre d' of the hotel, Carl Uka, through a back exit. Uka led Kennedy through the kitchen area, holding Kennedy's right wrist, but frequently releasing it as Kennedy shook hands with those he encountered. Yuka and Kennedy started down a passageway narrowed by an ice machine against the right wall and a steam table to the left. Kennedy turned to his left and shook hands with busboy Juan Romero. As Sirhan Sirhan stepped down from a low tray stacker beside the ice machine, rushed past Yuka and repeatedly fired what was later identified as a 22 caliber Ivor Johnson cadet revolver. After Kennedy had fallen to the floor, security man Bill Barry saw Sirhan holding a gun and hit him twice in the face. While others forced Sirhan against the steam table and disarmed him. As he continued firing his gun in random directions, after a minute, Sirhan wrestled free and grabbed the revolver again. but he had already fired all the bullets and was subdued. Barry went to Kennedy and laid his jacket under the candidate's head, later recalling, I knew immediately it was a 22, a small caliber, so I hoped it wouldn't be so bad. But then I saw the hole in the senator's head and I knew. Reporters and photographers rushed into the area from both directions, contributing to the confusion and chaos. As Kennedy lay wounded, Juan Romero cradled the senator's head and placed a rosary in his hand. Kennedy asked Romero, is everybody safe, okay? And Romero responded, yes, yes, everything is going to be okay. Ethel Kennedy stood outside the crush of people at the scene, seeking help. She was soon led to her husband and knelt beside him. He turned his head and seemed to recognise her. After several minutes, medical attendants arrived and lifted Kennedy onto a stretcher, prompting him to whisper, Don't lift me. He lost consciousness shortly thereafter. Kennedy was taken a mile away to Central Receiving Hospital, where he arrived near death. One doctor slapped his face, calling Bob, Bob, while another massaged Kennedy's heart. After obtaining a good heartbeat, doctors handed a stethoscope to Ethel Kennedy, so she could hear her husband's heart beating, much to her relief. After about 30 minutes, Kennedy was transferred several blocks to the hospital of the Good Samaritan for surgery. A gymnasium near the hospital was set up as a temporary headquarters for the press and news media to receive updates on the senator's condition. Surgery began at 3.12 a.m. and lasted three hours and 40 minutes. Ten and a half hours later at 5.30 p.m. on Wednesday, spokesman Frank Mankiewicz 
announced that Kennedy's doctors were concerned over his continuing failure to show improvement. His condition remained extremely critical as to life. Here at the Ambassador Hotel Los Angeles at the moment of his greatest political triumph. Bobby Kennedy too had been gunned down. For 25 hours, he clung to life at the Good Samaritan Hospital, a bullet lodged in his brain. Surgeons fought to save him. Waiting crowds prayed. Their prayers echoed throughout the United States, throughout the world. It was unbelievable that such a tragedy could happen twice in the same family. Jackie Kennedy, sister-in-law, widow of the late president, arrived to join the family's bedside vigil. She knew so well the horror of this moment. As the hours ticked away, Senator Robert Kennedy's grasp on life went with them. Kennedy had been shot three times. One bullet, fired at a range of about one inch, entered behind his right ear, dispersing fragments throughout his brain. Two others entered at the rear of his right armpit. One exited from his chest and the other lodged in the back of his neck. Now this train was bearing the body of Robert to join his brother on that hillside. As the funeral train passed through town after town, the people of America paid tribute. The flag which had draped the coffin was folded in traditional manner by Colonel Glenn as the family sadly looked on. Colonel Glenn handed it to Senator Edward Kennedy. It now belonged to the widow, the ten orphan children, and the unborn infant that will never know its great father. Despite extensive neurosurgery at the Good Samaritan Hospital, to remove the bullet and bone fragments from his brain, Kennedy died at 1.44 a.m. on June 6, nearly 26 hours after the shooting. In 1969, the circumstances involving the death of Mary Jo Kopechny, whose body was discovered underwater inside an automobile belonging to US Senator Edward M. Kennedy, became known as the Chappaquiddick incident. During the early morning hours of July 19, 1969, Kopechny's body was found inside a car in a tidal channel on Chappaquiddick Island, Massachusetts. Edward Kennedy had been driving Mary Jo home from a party he had hosted the night before, when he accidentally drove off a bridge and crashed into the water below. Edward survived the crash and swam to shore. He attempted to rescue Mary Jo several times by diving back into the water, before eventually returning to the party on foot to get help. Edward enlisted the help of two men, Joseph Gargan and Paul Markham. Both men returned with Edward to where the car had entered the water and attempted to rescue Mary Jo. After multiple failed attempts to locate Mary Jo inside the car, the two men drove Edward back to the ferry landing, 
Edward told the two men not to inform the other guests back at the party what had happened, as he feared that it would cause them to panic and attempt to rescue Mary Jo themselves, leading them to put their own lives in danger. He then dove into the water and swam across the 500-foot channel back to his hotel room in Edgerton. At no point did Edward alert the authorities as to what had happened. The following morning, two fishermen noticed the submerged vehicle in the water and alerted police. It was asserted by one of the rescue divers that Mary Jo had died from suffocation and not drowning or injuries sustained in the crash. Her head was facing upwards and pushed into a small pocket of air. It was estimated that she may have survived for three to four hours after the crash and that had rescuers been called at the time of the accident, she may have survived. After pleading guilty to a charge of leaving the scene of an accident after causing injury, Edward received a suspended sentence for two months in jail. The incident became a national scandal and may have influenced Edward's decision not to campaign for President of the United States in 1972 and 1976. Edward finally announced his candidacy for the presidency in 1979, challenging incumbent President Jimmy Carter for the Democratic nomination for the 1980 election. Edward lost the nomination to Jimmy Carter, but remained a senator until his death from brain cancer on Tuesday, August 25, 2009. On July 16, 1999, John F. Kennedy, along with his wife Carolyn and sister-in-law Lauren Bassett, was reported missing when the Piper Saratoga he was piloting failed to arrive at its planned destination. A search commenced more than 15 hours later to locate them, finally ending in the late afternoon hours of July 21, when the bodies of John F. Kennedy Jr his wife and his sister-in-law were recovered from the ocean floor by Navy divers. The National Transportation Safety Board determined that the plane had crashed into the Atlantic Ocean off Martha's Vineyard, the probable cause being pilot error. In the evening of July 21, autopsies at the County Medical Examiner's Office revealed that the crash victims had died upon impact. Along with JFK Jr., there have also been other tragedies surrounding the grandchildren of Joe and Rose Kennedy. On August 13, 1973, Robert F. Kennedy's son, Joseph Patrick Kennedy II, was the driver of a car that crashed. He survived relatively unhurt. However, his passenger, Pam Kelly, was permanently paralyzed. Cara A. Kennedy Allen was the eldest daughter of Edward M. Kennedy. On September 16, 2011, Kennedy suffered a fatal heart attack in a Washington, D.C. health club after her daily workout. She was 51. Mary Richardson Kennedy, wife of Robert F. Kennedy Jr., hanged herself on the grounds of her home in Bedford on May 16, 2012. She'd been battling depression and was engaged in a bitter divorce proceeding with Robert Kennedy Jr. at the time. Following the 1960 election of US President John F. Kennedy, he and his two younger brothers, Robert F. Kennedy and Edward M. Kennedy, soon all held prominent positions in the federal government and received intensive publicity, often emphasizing their youth, allure, education, and collective future in politics. From 1947, when John F. Kennedy was first elected to Congress, to 2011, when Patrick J. Kennedy departed Congress, there was a 64-year run of a Kennedy family member holding an elective office in Washington.
This spans more than a quarter of the nation's existence. But for all of the family's wealth, power and influence over the United States of America and the world, they have suffered through some of the greatest personal and public tragedies. These events and their impact on the lives of the Kennedy family are known as the Kennedy Curse.